Good day, everyone. Welcome back to our YouTube channel for another fantastic OCR interview. Just the other day, we brought you Spartan world champion Ryan Atkins. And today, it is his wife, Spartan world champion Lindsay Webster. We just spoke moments ago, and I'm very excited to bring it to you. Away we go. What I would like to know about Lindsay is you and Ryan are two very prepared athletes. Some people like to just, hey man, let's just wing it. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go out there and do my thing and whatever happens. I know you and Ryan uh, like to be very prepared. So they said, oh, running in sand is kind of like running in snow, but it's not like you're running in snow for six weeks leading up to the race. So when you first get there and you really are doing that first, you know, sort of deep sand running, what, what were you, what were your thoughts? My thoughts actually, so yeah, I mean, it was very similar actually to running in deep snow in that like when you're running, you want to place your feet where people have already gone. Um, so like, obviously if you're in snow, you do the same thing. Otherwise you're tracking your way through snow. That's up to your middle of your shins. Um, yeah. Uh, and I found like just the muscles that it used were fairly similar, but like you said, I mean, it, it's not like we were running in snow for six weeks leading up to this. I think I got to run in snow for like, I don't know, maybe twice. Um, so I think that was what, like towards the end of the race, I was starting to cramp a little bit as were a lot of people. And I think it's just cause like, yeah, I mean, I know how to run like that. And that I think that paid off a lot, having practiced so much running in snow. But, like, it's not like my muscles are prepared at this point in time. So, yeah, it's getting a little tired towards the end there. So how did your couple days leading up to the race differ from, say, running at a normal Spartan? Um, More rest time, for sure. Like, leading into a normal Spartan, I usually, like, train normally and then rest the Thursday and then the Friday we'll just do like half an hour with some little pickups to get the blood pumping and stuff. Um, but this, for this race, um, I think for like four or five days leading up to the race, we were running just like half an hour or an hour. Um, so yeah, a little bit lower, lower volume than normally. I would say that like in the, month leading up to the race it actually was quite different than normal because yeah you were saying oh you guys are always very prepared but this this year because we had spartan games was quite different um normally for like spartan world champs i'd make myself a whole training plan and like a proper taper and stuff but this year because we had spartan games um i had to take like a couple weeks off after spartan games just to start feeling like normal again and not exhausted all the time um, and then after that, it was just, it was like a lot of winging it and just like listening to my body and saying like, oh, t you know, today I'm tired. So I'll like take it easy again. Um, or like, oh, I feel good today. So I'll go hard. And I would have all these days where like either I'd feel really good or I'd feel just like awful and exhausted. Um, which like I, I had to try really hard not to let stress me out because um, cause it's, to me, it felt like I was like massively under training leading up to the biggest race of the year. But then also like, I was like, I just have to trust my body and know that like I'm doing what it needs right now. Um, so yeah, I think a little bit of like the, the being a veteran at this, um, came into play a lot. And then of course, Ryan's like, so analytical about like gear and the sauna and how long we had to spend in the sauna so like in all of those ways we were like very prepared um it's just that the training looked a lot different than it normally does and that was the most long-winded answer that i've ever given <laughs> the, the, the people want to know Lindsay. uh it keeps freezing a little bit though are you in a good signal place i am i don't know how to make that better i mean i can turn off my video no, no, turn off the video. What are you talking about? We're gonna we're gonna use this on YouTube, man. That's true. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna make this happen. You know what you could do though really quickly? Just do this. Like if you okay. just fix the lens a little bit, that is I do that often too, because you forget. Oh, it looks a little better. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the competition, so the competition at Spartan Worlds, 
looked very different than your competition the rest of the year. Yes, we had Ida and some others at OCRWC, but this is some, you know, the first real world competition we've seen in a long time. How does that change your mindset at the start line or going into a race? Um, I think I was excited because, you know, all year, like, um, Annie's been getting really better and better, but like, we still are missing some of our usual suspects like Nicole and Rebecca. Um, and so I was pretty excited to like, I don't know, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. Like compete against, uh, people on like a world scale and be like, you know, I haven't just been, I guess like I, I was curious about what kind of shape I was in too. It's like, um, you know, have I just been like doing really well this year because Nicole's not there who normally is the number one person who would challenge me or like, am I actually as fit as I think I am? And I would try and do all other races and like FKTs and stuff as the year um, played out to try and like test, you know, my times against myself and people in the trail running world and stuff. Um, but yeah, like I was curious to like, you know, take the competition to a, a world scale level and see how I did. Talk to me some more. Talk to me some more about when you say trusting your training and and being a veteran. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, it's easy. It's so easy for athletes to like get wrapped up in. I guess, training plans and like how much volume a week you have to put in and stuff. And I would say when I first started um, racing, I would like, I trained a lot less hours than I do now. And I did a lot more kind of like listening to my body and stuff. And um, I, I was just like on a learning curve and I didn't really know my body as well as I do now. Um, but as the years have progressed, it's like, oh yeah, I know that normally like I would do these be doing you know these sorts of things putting in this many hours um and so yeah just like and then first part in world champs i've like prepared the same way more or less for like years now and then to just like change that suddenly this year and be like okay <laughs> i'm just gonna like go back to the old listening to the body um i think it just i don't know like i think a lot of athletes um because athletes can be so type a and like forget just to listen to their bodies because they're like oh you have to you know i'm not going to be fit if i don't do all of this training and all of these hours but um i think too like if you know your body really well it's important to like um know you know you're tired and it's okay to like uh to like lay low a bit and that you're not actually going to lose fitness. Like I think, I think it's like two weeks that you can literally do nothing before you actually start losing any fitness. So for me to just be like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to spend a few weeks to like, to lay low and then just like maintain whatever fitness that I have coming into to world champs, like hopefully it'll go well. But um, yeah, there's like a massive kind of process of like trusting myself that I had to rely on this year. So I think if I if I did that the first two years that I was like an athlete in this sport, then I wouldn't have known my body well enough for it to like go well <laughs> um, or like to know, to have enough knowledge base. And then I think I probably went through a couple of years where I would have been like, oh no, like I need to train through it. And then I would have come into this event overtired. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. Okay. So, t so take me through the race. Speaking of knowing your body and, and trusting yourself, you know that women are going to go out hot, right? You know, there are women who are going to be in front of you, right? Yeah, but they didn't. I was surprised. So really, I thought I saw Miriam maybe out front there quickly early. Yeah, I will say though, I think, I mean, I, Miriam's like an incredible runner for sure. If we were just like on, if this course had no obstacles, she probably would have won the thing. She's like the best runner of all of us. Um, and she was running a really comfortable pace. Like her breathing was not labored. Um, so yeah, she was out in front, but like it was, it suited her. I wouldn't say that she like went out hard for what she was capable of. Um, 
And then I think Emma like laid low a bit. I was expecting that she'd go out hard, but I talked to her actually on the start line. She was like, that would only be in everybody else's favor. <laughs> so she runs a smart race. Like she knows how to pace herself. Right. Um, yeah. And then I thought like Annie sometimes goes out pretty hard, but she, she also like ran a smart race. And I think everybody knew that was the ticket for this race was like that it was going to be long and it was going to be tough for using muscles that, you know, aren't, necessarily like used to running and terrain like that um so everybody was pretty smart and started slow so when you got to that like middle of the race hill that you know that ryan described with like he said he was like literally like crawling yeah that was like i think my low point during the race because like so they put ropes down it and you're like literally crawling on your hands and feet um, and you're like, ah, oh, if I can just get to the rope and every step you take, you like slide half a step down. So I finally got to the freaking rope and then like, it doesn't actually get any easier. <laughs> so I was like, oh, it'll be easier once I reach the rope and I can use my arms too. But like, it really wasn't. <laughs> um, and then you get to the top of the rope and then it actually kept going uphill and like traversed. Um, and like, you're only halfway up the thing. So, and then you got to kind of like keep gradually running uphill forever in this like really deep sand. So anyway, so that just like went on, on. <laughs> yeah. So which, which mile did you start to relax or did you? Um, I'm not sure really that I, I did. I kind of. I would say I made my move coming in. So the way the course was, there was, there was like a first loop, which actually was the super course. And then if you're doing the beast, you had to go out and do this whole second loop. Um, and so coming towards the end of the first loop, there was like a few hard obstacles. And I was with Emma and Miriam. Um, but because uh, like Emma's new, she's not as fast at obstacles yet. And Miriam just like hasn't practiced them for a year. <laughs> Um, I was like, I think if I can like do these fast enough, then I'll make a bit of a gap. And then that's where I wanted to like make a move to like pull ahead of them, um, which I did. And then, so I kind of made my move like really early on in the race, which was a bit of a weird strategy because normally you'd kind of ramp it up as the race went on, but instead I like, <laughs> play like ramp up was in the middle and then I went back down, <laughs> um, but I did, I put in a gap um, and then I, I guess my thought process was like, if I can just maintain this gap coming into like the finish line area and it's still those two towards the front, then like, I think I can be faster on all these, this obstacle gauntlet coming into the finish than everybody except maybe Annie. So I was like, as long as I can like maintain a gap and like, even if we come into the obstacles at the end at the same time, then like, I think I can take it. Um, so yeah, so like made my move in the wall and then like got to the top of that freaking massive sand dune with the ropes. And then <laughs> I started feeling a little like bonky and loopy. And um, so then I like tuned it down a little bit, but um, actually it like felt a lot like, you know, when you, have you ever had one of those nightmares where you're like trying to run away from something? <laughs> Like it's chasing you or someone, but you're like stuck in water or like right. mud and you just like can't run. That's what like leading this race felt like in the middle in the sand. Like I literally was like, I'm trying so hard, but like I just feel like I'm moving nowhere. And like I didn't, I don't know. And that running in the sand's funny because if you go like hard, you go like a certain speed. And then if you go really hard, you go like maybe one second per mile faster, but you're like outputting so much more energy. So it was kind of funny that way. But then at the same time, I didn't want to be like, oh, I'm going to tune down like how hard I'm trying because I'm being chased. So like it was very stressful. <laughs> so so yeah, anyway, long-winded answer to your question was that I never really turned it off. I just got really bonky towards the end of the race, but kept trying to try hard. And then I got a little crampy and I was like, oh God. If I can just get to the, I still had like a mile and a half of the course left. And I was like, if I can just get to the finish without cramping, 
and I think I can win it. But again, it was really a case of like, it's not over until it's over. Cause even the slip ball at the very end, I was like, I don't know if I can run up that thing right now without my legs cramping on me. <laughs> I didn't know if I'd be able to do the hercoise because I, cause I was like afraid that I was going to cramp on it. But anyway, got through it all worked out. Okay. Early in the year at Hildervat and Savage, you had struggled a little bit on obstacles. At that time, were you concerned or were you like, eh, it's been pandemic, I haven't raced much, I'm, I'm sure I'll be fit for the rest of the year? Yeah, it's funny, after this race, I was like reflecting back on that because that obviously was a race in sand too. And I was like, wow, I've come a long way since then. I was freaking out of shape after COVID. <laughs> and then also... Yeah, I mean, just like terrible at obstacles. So I'd all the obviously gyms here, um, including the rock climbing gyms were closed and stuff. So but we do have like an indoor platinum rig. So I'd been using that and throughout the pandemic and thinking like, oh, I'm maintaining my strength. If, if not like getting better, I can at least maintain it. But I think because it's in like a room, you can't really get a good swing going without right. hitting like a wall or a mirror or a bike. <laughs> so um, I was talking with Nicole about this at Hildervat. She was like, you need to like use your legs to swing. Like you're so um, stiff kind of. And like I was watching videos of myself after and I was like, yeah, it's like I've forgotten how to like use my lower body momentum on obstacles. And I think it's because I was practicing all the time inside and like just not wanting to like yeah, use that lower body momentum or else I'd hit a wall, literally a wall. So, yeah. So anyway, um, it came back gradually throughout the year, but yeah, it did take like half the year for me to almost like re reteach myself how to do obstacles. So it's kind of, kind of funny. So take me through the finish. Everyone has been, you know, very moved by a couple of things. One was Ryan's finish line interview and then you coming through to, to see him. Yeah. I was so proud of him. So oh, I just, yeah. So I listened to your podcast beforehand and how you were like, I'm not even saying he'll be the fastest man out there. I'm saying that like something magical is going to happen and he's going to win the thing. <laughs> and I was like, I totally agree. Thanks for supporting Matt. <laughs> you always believe in us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, like, it was funny because we were hanging out with John Alvin, too, and, like, the days leading up to the race. And normally, like, I don't know, we've hung out with him before races and stuff, but this time you could see that it was, like, causing probably the both of them and definitely Ryan, like, a bit of kind of stress to be, like, hanging out with their top competitor leading <laughs> into the biggest race of the year, especially because they just had no idea, like, you know, what this course is going to be like, what they're – where they're – fitness levels like we're going to be at compared to the other person we haven't seen john in like two years now because of the pandemic so normally we see him a couple times throughout the year and we'll have like a reference point um but we just yeah had no idea so so that was kind of funny um but then yeah i heard so what was i hearing so after that first loop of the course i was heading back up big sand dune on my way out for the second loop and the I could hear the announcer like in the festival area kind of giving like a play-by-play -play. right um, and it was basically I think Ryan was leading but um John was right behind him and Sergey was there so I was like come on Ryan and then I would ask like the rabbits who were chasing me <laughs> throughout my race like how's how's Ryan doing like I just knew how bad he wanted it and I wanted also for him so badly to just win the thing this time um and then when did I hear so it, it was actually like after it got dark and I was jumping over a wall and the, the rabbit that I was at was wearing a radio and they announced to the rabbit that Ryan won right um, and that's when I found out so then yeah so I, when I finished I like I was like where is he where is he because <laughs> I was so excited for him and I wanted to give him a big hug yeah He's just been hunting it for so long. And like for me, I was like super stoked to be to win it the for the third time and stuff. But like, yeah, I almost was like more excited for him than I was even about my own finish. Like, yeah. Well, I think that's what people are 
you know, people are moved by. And it's not that you don't care because obviously you do. Yeah. But when the person you love, right, like wants something. I mean, I was, when Stacy did her show, I was like a mental case. You know what I mean? I was like when they were calling, because they, you know, they go backwards fifth to first. And I'm like, every time they mentioned a name, I was like, okay, okay, okay. You know what I mean? So, uh, but I think what, what it makes me think about is that we, you know, this is obviously my profession, but just the general public, we think we know, we, we have these hot takes or opinions about racers. And, you know, I'll speak very personally. When Ryan came in second the last time, mm -hmm. I was basically interviewing him at the finish line, like, why, you know, why aren't you more bummed out, basically, right? It was my opinion about it. And Ryan was like, I get, I gave it my best, thrilled with second today, right? We, we didn't know you guys also had just come from Eco, right? Yeah. But, but I had like some opinion about it, right? And like, maybe it isn't that important to him, right? Like, that's what I remember thinking. And clearly, you know, that day, that's what it was for him. And this was a new year and a different thing. And everything you guys have been through and his, you know, finishing second to John, I think seven times, maybe eight, like five times at Spartan and a couple of times at OCRWC. And so we kind of finally, finally got to see what we thought was probably in there, which is Ryan really, really, really wanting that, you know, particular brass ring. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so that last year that you were talking about how he did eco, like before he committed to eco, he was just like, oh, should I do it? Because it's going to, I probably won't be able to do worlds. And so like he, he, yeah, I mean, his focus that year was eco challenge. And he came into worlds thinking like, I might not even be able to race this depending on how recovered I am and stuff. And um, so that was kind of a shot in the dark. But actually the year before that one, <clears throat> we had been out in the van like, prepping for it and stuff and I just remember that being one of the years that like I've never seen him so focused on a race so that would have been 2018 18 right yeah and he was pretty bummed that time um when he finished second to John and again like he gave it his all and I think that was the year he was like chasing John down to the finish line right um, like literally you could see Ryan coming down the hill it was like less than 30 seconds or something yeah and like very nearly closed the gap on him and John was like yeah, he really made John try hard. Uh, I think John's mind was a bit blown because not too many people can catch John on downhills. Um, <clears throat> so he was like a bit bummed that year. And yeah, but I mean, he he always like gives it his all. So I think when you do that, it's hard to have too many regrets because you know that you just like had nothing more to give. Um, but then again, this year I'd seen him prepping for it and like literally doing everything he could and a lot of the prep this year was super miserable like other years it's just like oh yeah go run outside in the fall leaves but like this year it was like there were some sucky things that we had to do to get ready for it so um he slept in an altitude tent for we slept in separate beds for a month <laughs> I was like I'm not sleeping in that thing with you <laughs> um so he had it set up downstairs here in a separate bedroom and I was like bummed when because I thought maybe I'd be able to talk him out of it because I didn't want to sleep in separate beds for a month. But he was like, no, I'm going to do it. Like, I want to do everything that I can to get ready for this race. So we got, we finished Farn Games and got home. And he, he had like slept in the altitude tent ever since. Because he's like, well, you know, even if it can give me an extra 10 seconds, then it'll be worth it. So, so, so the race isn't at altitude, but it's still good to sleep in the altitude tent? Uh, I don't know. Like there's so many, that's what I said to him because I was like, we are going out early. Like you're going to finish sleeping in the tent like a full week before we even race. Are you still going to have any like benefits from the thing up to that point? And I mean, you can talk to him about this because he, he's like such a researcher. He knows all the stats. And my understanding was like for only three days, you'll receive some benefits. Um, so like if you, if you go up to altitude and race at altitude, and you're actually acclimated, like the, the benefits will be a lot more. But if you're like, if you live at altitude and you come down to sea level and race, like you're only going to get a couple percent out of it. It's not like an astronomical difference, but he was like hunting, you know, for per little percents here and there. Um, so apparently according to Ryan, there, there were still like some benefits, um, even though he hadn't, there would have been some benefits still, even though he hadn't slept in it for like a week. Do you think you can put into words what it's like winning a race like this with your husband on the top of the podium with you, you know, for your country? Like, can you talk about that? 
I <laughs> I like very nearly started crying on the podium, <laughs> like happy tears. <laughs> it was a uh, yeah, like I just was st standing up there and like it it kind of all like hit me at once just that we were at world championships and like they're playing our anthem and you know there's like a whole crowd there standing and watching and cheering and it's not an olympic sport but like this is our i guess equivalent of like our olympics so i was just like oh man like is this what it feels like when people stand in an olympic podium and then also to just like be able to do it with him i think when you win this race it's a bit it's a bit funny because like you finish and you're like oh amazing I won that's awesome but it's it's not for like the couple days after in like the really quiet moments when you're just like making coffee or something when you like start internalizing it and you're like oh my gosh I succeeded in this massive goal that I've been working towards for so long and you'll just like have a massive smile on your face and <laughs> you're just like standing there making your coffee and uh, normally after we leave a race venue like we'll talk about the race afterwards and stuff and then we'll come home and we won't really like you know be talking about it for days and days afterwards but like Ryan kept bringing it up like all he wanted to talk about for days was like the race um and I was like I know exactly how he feels right now because like that's how I felt too after the first time that I won it and then definitely this time too especially because we we got to share it together and like yeah funny well that that's awesome sorry my cat's gonna blow away outside so i'm just gonna go let him in yeah, people <laughs> love seeing the pets so you should bring the pets in the feed people love it oh <laughs> he's standing it's, it's... outside he's like it's freaking cold out here and super windy <laughs> let me in poor guy Anyway, um, sorry. Continue. That's all I had for you. That was yeah. that was that was perfect. That was awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. I can't wait till we have something in and around Atlanta again, and I get to see, <laughs> see your house. I think it's been like two years since I've seen Jackson. Oh hi. Yeah. So. Well, maybe I'll bring him to Jacksonville. Maybe I don't know. Oh, you guys are skipping that one. Um. I might do it. Yeah, come down and do it. Did Ryan tell you what he's got going on? So he's definitely not going to be doing Jacksonville. because He told he, me he definitely wasn't. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe I should leave it for him to tell you guys. But, yeah, he qualified for, like, a pretty cool race. Um, so he will be elsewhere. Um, oh, yeah, he did, he did tell me. I can't remember what it was, but he did tell me. Okay. Yeah, so he qualified for the Iditarod, which is. Yes, like, yes, he said he's running that historic uh dog sled race that's been around right but he's but he's doing the bike version yeah so he's biking it actually so now and now it's like they have dog sledding and biking and running and skiing so right he's gonna bike it um and i'm like torn because either i don't know the thing is like i won't be able to see him while he's out in the middle of nowhere doing that race but i'm also like i've wanted to go to alaska forever we almost did our honeymoon there so um so I was thinking maybe I'll do Jacksonville and I'll like fly to Alaska. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for taking time this morning. I really appreciate it. I know everybody is hitting you up these days since you won the world championship for the third time. Do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the little subscribe button right now. Then hit that bell that notifies you when the videos come. We do a lot of watch parties, which are super fun. You might be watching this on a watch party right now. If you're not, Click the uh, live comments, click the chat replay, and you'll see all the kind of fun chatter we have in here when you become part of the subscribed notifications peoples, right? That was a sentence that made no sense. I don't care. It's me and Elon just hanging out. Love you. Miss you. Mean it. Gotta run.